and from quite a technical point of view, just giving a little summary of where we're going with that. I'm going to talk about some similar things, but from a completely different angle, giving you uh, some of my thoughts on why we're doing this, and uh, hopefully uh, giving you some something to think about in terms of the whole enterprise that we have of competences and informal learning. And a lot of it will echo some of the things that Nick has been uh, talking about. We've been talking to each other. I haven't seen his presentation, but we, we are in some ways in connection with that. Okay, I'm Di Griffiths. I'm sitting here. And uh, this is not my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm in good hands, at least here will. Well, the. Um, I don't know which. I'm uh, sick about that. <laughs> <The first, laughs> by my memory, the first slide, slide says uh, that. Um, <laughs> you know, the first slide talks about. Oh, there were, there were too, too much attention going on the, the technical work. <laughs> 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 well, oh, well done, well done. Give me full screen and off you go. This is your presentation. Uh, yes, it's it. <laughs> okay, give me the first slide. That's good. I'm sorry. Oh, no, back. There we are. Yep. Oh, I get the point. Good. And what do I do with that? Press the button. Which one? Okay, that's easy. So, using competences to help us in education, using informal learning offerings, they're attractive things. But somehow, we seem to get stuck with them. I mean, I've been working in this area for 10 years, and I keep getting stuck. We try these things. We have not trained them with a great idea. You know, you think everybody would want this. In fact, you have to go in there and try and persuade people that actually they want to do this. And it's hard work. So why is it hard work? Is my question here. Um, why should it be like this? That's oh, the wrong way. <laughs> okay. So do you know who this is? Who was this? This is Socrates. And why am I putting Socrates there? Well, the question here is, is this informal? Not for them. I mean, in some ways, it's extremely formal. It couldn't be more formal. It's full of logic. It's formal philosophy. Uh, you know, this is where it all started. It's extremely formal and structured in what he's saying, but it's totally informal in terms of it has no timetable. It has no... Um, uh, learning outcomes. It has no assessment method. You know, it's just to turn up. You know, underneath the should be an oak grove, but it seems to be a palm grove. You can turn up under the tree and you talk. But in some ways, it's very formal. So, what's going on here? What, how do we describe this thing that's happening? And um, then we've got this. So, a thousand years later. You've got this conversation that's been put in a book, and ex cathedra, somebody sitting on a chair, a reader reads the book. I used to be a reader. The name survives. And they're reading a book. Now, Socrates would have said this was a bad idea because they get the words but not the wisdom. And these people who are sitting here are going to be really difficult to get along with because they're going to think they know it all and they don't. That was what Socrates would have said, but that's beside the point. The point here is, is this formal or not? Well, is it more formal because it's in a book? No, no. Education here is getting to know the book. The learning outcomes are kind of very, not very clear. You get to know the book. You sit there and you listen and you read it. Um, but it's kind of more formal because there was there was a you know a building and an institution, so we're kind of moving towards formality. But it's not education like we know it. 
I would suggest to you, having given you these kind of couple of examples, <coughs> that the formality is in the management. That's where the formality is. <coughs> it's not in the education, it's in the management. And here's a quote from the 18th century, Giusti, who was the kind of the inventor of the modern education system in some ways. To this end, all instructors must report their upcoming lectures on time. I'm sure Matthias probably can tell us about Giusti, probably. Is it Matthias? Yeah, you can maybe tell me about Giusti in the afterwards. After to this end, all instructors must report their upcoming lectures on time so that one, that is the Ministry of Education, or the Ministry, can judge whether there is a lack in the presentation of this or that discipline. Now, this is a first. This is where the education authorities start, or the, the government says, oh, these people are just sitting around listening to books, and we don't even know if they're turning up. And if somebody's paying for that chair, and they're paying for it. So what's going on here? Why are we going to, how are we going to manage this? And since then, since this intervention, we've had a continuing increase in the amount of management that we have to deal with. I'm sure everybody in this room has to deal with governments, authorities, ministries, uh, timetables, curricula, lesson planning, reporting, assessment, you know, all these instruments. We'll deal with them. So I'm suggesting the important thing here is in, in what determines whether learning is formal is the management of it, not in the learning. And we've been distracted by the word learning in informal learning to situate the difference not in the management system, but in the learner. You're saying you're learning, which and now you're learning now, it's informal. But an hour later, your learning now is formal. So the learning is in you, not in the, in the system. Well, I think this is probably, mostly, a mistake. You might be able to find a neurological basis which says that learning to ride the bicycle is different from learning how to do syllogisms. But understanding syllogisms, like Socrates might have been asking us to do, is the same whether you're doing it from a book, a conversation in the pub, under an oak tree, as part of an exam. That's the same. Am I convincing you here? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, clear. I'm, I'm making an argument, okay? Um, now, so you've got this expanding management of education. And around the 20th century, we had a modus vivendi appear. By modus vivendi, I mean people got along. They didn't agree, but they got along. So you have a well-established methods for controlling the classroom and well-established practices in the classroom. And to some extent, these are independent. The curriculum is established, the reports are sent back, the assessments are sent back, the teacher gets on with the teaching in the classroom, and the Ministry of Education doesn't really know what happens in the classroom, and everybody's kind of happy. You know, the, the curriculum gets gradually evolves, and things kind of move along. And there's enough give, in, there's enough flexibility in the system to handle that. But a lot of the really critical bits of teaching are invisible to management. Does this part sound familiar to you? I mean, do you, you recognise this? That when you, were in the, when you were in infant school, lots of things that the teachers did were not controlled by the Ministry of Education and in secondary school. They said, okay, what we do now, we'll, take, we'll do this. Now, we had some good intentions so I put some smileys on to give us a good feeling for these good intentions. Because it's depressing that the regulatory framework is so different from what goes on in the classroom. We would like to make it all work better. And we would like to liberate schools from and, and universities from the constraints of the management system. So here's two very good ideas. One is Let's make sure that learning is not a process that's just carried out in the classroom. Let's make sure that we can do, all the learners can do something real with what they do in the classroom. And we'll describe the real things that they have to do. And we'll call them competencies. And that way, we can get away from the dry academic teaching. Good idea. And the other good idea is, 
We can take all the learning that people do outside the classroom and give them value for that learning and record it. We have a Centre for Recording Achievement in the UK, which is a big thing to try and record all the valuable learning which people do. Now, nobody can say that these are not two good ideas. They're very good intentions. We have an expression in, uh, in England, in English, which is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> and that's what we walk along. So, the problem is that both competencies and informal learning recognition bring things into the managed world, which were before outside the managed world. So what you're doing, in effect, is expanding the domain of managed learning into areas which before were not managed. Now this is problematic. At the same time, technology, I'm a learning technologist, I'm responsible, technology increases the capability of the manager to control what is happening in the classroom. Because we have learning analytics, we have automated systems for assigning this resource to that learning objective, we have management systems which allow the processing of learning by objectives and the tick boxes which say that you have done this and you have not done this and the punishment of the teachers who do not. This is not, this is not just education, this is the health service all over. Now both these, the, so the technology, the, the, the competence, um, management of competences by technology, managing of um, bringing things informal learning in, both these go hand in hand with this managerial changes, um, which are happening. I will, I'm, I'm trying not to go too deep into this so we get through this before too long. Now, I am not saying that every competence-based management and learning system is evil. I'm not saying this. Sometimes it is what you need. You only have to look at uh, young people learning their, uh, to play heavy metal guitar for hours on end with a machine to realize for that purpose it's what they need. And there are lots of other formal Keep going, no, 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 sure you can sort of, oh, right, <laughs> <laughs> um, who, who is Juan here? Is it you? Yeah. So, uh, there clearly are places where this kind of formal, structured work is appropriate. Um, it's probably also appropriate if you're in a hospital and you want to make sure that the person who's going to give you your blood transfusion does the right thing. You know, so... I'm not denying that there are useful places. I'm pointing out that the implications, the implications of this are problematic for education as a whole. Because it squeezes out the space that was available for teachers, the flexibility which was available in the system. These competencies, technology, incorporating new, the, the informal. Is, that, is it clear what kind of position I'm, I'm taking here? Next. No, next. Oh, sorry. I, I was, now, this is a remarkable text. I couldn't resist giving you this text. I'm going to read it because I like it so much. Suarez Miranda Viaje de Varones Prudentes from the 17th century. Do you remember all this? No? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> In that empire, the art of cartography gained such perfection that a map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city. And the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied in the cartographer's guilds struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations who were not so fond of the art of cartography 
Um, uh, uh, study of cartography, as their forefathers had been, saw the vast map was useless, and not without some pitilessness, that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of the sun and the winters. In the deserts of the West today, there are still tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the discipline of, of geography. Now, but this text, from 17th century, I'm sure, comes to us amazingly through Borges, who has put it, included it in one of his books. You know Borges, I think, some of you? Everybody must know Borges. Borges, Jorge Luis Borges. Okay, this is a text from Jorge Luis Borges, which he says comes from Viajes de Bonanes Prudentes. Now you can see what we are, what he is warning us about here. He's saying, there comes a point where an obsession with accuracy becomes less useful. The more you become more accurate, more detailed, but less effective. So we need to be watch out for that point when we are doing our descriptions of any, the educational world, just as we do it in our in descriptions of the geographical world. Oh, okay. So, if the road to hell is paved with good intentions, is there another route we can take? When we talk about informal learning, we identi identify informality or formality as an aspect of learning, not as management. So when we look at informal learning activities, we try to validate, validate the informal learning that has occurred. And that's where we create our problem. Because as soon as we go into validating the informal learning, we bring it into the sphere of the formal. So what can we do? Do we just give up and say, we can't say anything about informal learning? My suggestion would be, that if we want to take this somewhere, we try, we forget about validating the learning. We forget about proving that somebody has learned something. We think instead about what the area of activity is that somebody's been active in there. And we focus on that. And we try and find some useful information about which we can use from those activities which we can share between the person and the employer, and see what useful things come out. So what kind of thing might we usefully do? Well, we look at Google, Amazon, and Wonga. Do you know Wonga? Probably not. It's worth knowing. Wonga is an evil organization in the United Kingdom. It's a very unpopular organization. They, they give payday loans. They make loans to poor people at very, very, very high rates of interest. And they make a decision on whether they will give you a loan in minutes. If you go to the website and ask for a loan, within minutes they will give you a decision. So they are making their decisions on the basis of what they know about you from your interactions with the website and from the web. That's a very interesting and scary idea. Um, now, this kind of information which these companies have could be very useful to us because they know more about us than we know in some ways. So that potentially is useful to us because it tells us what we are like. It tells you, you think you're like this, but actually, maybe, you have these things that you can do which you weren't thinking about. Or you think you're good at you know, this, but maybe, look, you know, I mean, there's lots of other related material which you don't know. Mm. Useful reflection. It tells us how other people see us as well. And for the employer, it tells them, you know this person's really good because they did a fantastic project last year. <coughs> But you know, because that project was successful, and because of the activities of these people, probably you could also ask this person to do that. 
And if you don't know about this, you could ask this person about it, because they'll probably know. Because the technology can tell you how one activity is connected to another. I'm not suggesting, remember, that the technology tells you whether I'm good or not. I'm assuming that my boss probably knows if I'm any good, because they have seen me doing something. So, my proposal, and this is really what Mark was talking about in completely different terms, is you probably heard this flipping the classroom uh, word, you may not, turning the, the, turning the activity around, turning the control around. So my question is, what would it mean to flip the analytics which people like Google do? Well, one thing it would mean is that we, as the users, would select the material which the analytics is done on. Not because it's in the web, not because somebody else decided, but because I decided that I want to use these documents, put these documents in the folder, put these communication sources in the folder, put these websites which I think are important in the folder, and do the analytics on that. Um, then we can use the analytics to to bring out, as Mark was saying, the topics that are related to that. He was talking about something rather more complex. I'm simplifying here. We can bring out the topics, and we can relate those topics to the web as a corpus. Because the web has a huge amount of information. If I just say in my sources quite a limited number of references to an area, the, the system can look at the web and say, well, if this person's interested in that and they think it's related to that, then there's all these connections which must go between them because we can look at the web and we can see that in order to get from here to here, you have to go through here. So you can use the web as an impersonal way of connecting these concepts. And if the, learn, if the learner or the employee doesn't like it, you change the things that you're analyzing because you should be in control. Say, no, that's not a good representation. Let's try putting some more documents in and see what comes out. I think that's perfectly okay. It's a, a way of presenting who you are, enriching it. Um, and well, you know, that's my last slide. So, um, why do I think this is useful? Because it's a basis for communication with your, your, your manager. We have this thing called PDP, Personal Development Plan. If it tells you what you think you are here, if you are here, then you are related to these other activities which you should be able to do. And it gives you a clue for where you might plan your future and how your manager might plan your future. Okay, so I've made the case that there's something interesting that we can do with informal learning, and if you like, competencies. Uh, I think there's a whole other discussion about competencies. I'm not, I can see how competencies could fit here. How this kind of information could tell you where you might go and give you something that you can share, and perhaps even give you, give an idea of what things you care about, because we have analytics for that as well. And I'll leave it there. And I hope I've given you some things to think about in that.